right, everybody. It looks like we're live. Sangram, thanks for joining us. Anytime, Billy. Get excited to be with you. Let's let's get this going. Yeah, yeah. Let's get it going. So first, um, if you don't know about about Sangram, you're probably you know living in a cave or you've got your head buried in the sand a little bit. He's everywhere. Um, he's done a lot of things in his career. He ran marketing at Pardot. He was a co-founder at Terminus. He's a best-selling author, podcast host. I mean, he's everywhere. So you can't escape the guy. But he's got great knowledge to share with us and uh, really excited. Anything anything I left out on your, your list of accomplishments? I'm sure there is. Well, there, there's definitely two two big ones. One, like married for 17 years and got two kids, uh, awesome. 12 and 8. So I feel like that probably trumps everything else. I, I agree. That That's awesome. Um, okay. So so we're going to talk about how do you adjust your, your go-to-market in today's environment. Um, I know we talked a lot about that in other sessions so far today. Um, Dave Elkington and uh, Mark Mon and Rick Tolman of Salesforce talked about it. If you haven't watched that, I encourage anybody to go back, watch it. It's about an hour. They've got a lot of great insights that the three of them shared. But want to get Sangram's uh, insight on this. I know you've got you've got some opinions. We talked a little bit yesterday and getting ready for this. And so what do you what do you think people should be doing to adjust? Because what worked 12 months ago, even six months ago, probably is not working as well as it used to for you. No, as a matter of fact, right before this call, I was in a call with a CMO of uh, over 100 million in revenue company. And by far, she said our pipeline was the best pipeline we had in quarter, like many quarters. And our conversion to win has been the least that has ever been. So yeah. this is a problem that every company of every size is facing. And it just becomes bigger, the bigger that your organization is. So uh, everybody hang in there. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of, of a matter of time on that for sure. But, you know, Billy, as you and I were chatting about it, what I have noticed that in, in the whole go-to-market space since I wrote the book, Move, which is on go-to-market in 2019, it, that there were two big and mega mega shifts that are happening in the space. Okay. And I think people need to really distill that down in order to see, well, what's the undercurrent of everything that's happening? Number one, um, the reality of it is that the metrics truly have changed. Um, meaning if Everybody for last decade or two decades, you and I, Billy, we, we probably have been focused on pipeline and revenue. Those are the most important yeah. metrics. And clearly they are important, like they, they, but they are still at a high level. The deeper metrics for companies to be successful, especially SaaS, if that's your business, it is your NRR and GRR. As a matter of fact, Yamini Rangan, who is the CEO of HubSpot, when I was interviewing her on that uh, on uh, in the peak community, which is for marketers, she said the number one metrics that she looks at success for her entire organization. That, remember, it's a public company. Yeah. Is NRR? That's it. NRR. If NRR is over hundred percent, it changes the equation for the for the organization. And we'll walk into an example of that. Um, yeah, in- yeah. So before we go any further, though, you know. We got mostly marketing salespeople. I'm sure a lot of them are familiar with what GRR and NRR are, but do you mind just giving yeah. the definition? So if anyone's like, what are they talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure somebody's Googling it and I don't know what you got out there. Uh, so let's just talk about the three main metrics. Like most people are probably familiar with ARR, which is annual yep. recurring revenue. You're just selling contracts at an annual rate, and that's pretty simple. GRR is your gross retention. Uh, revenue, which means that w- how much of your customers are you retaining, and and that has been one of the greatest challenges when you call when you hear about the leaky bucket problem. But that's what it is. You're, you're getting hundred customers and losing seventy of them, and that's a problem for a lot of companies even today. Um, and that's that's something you can start looking at as soon as you have a customer for a year or longer. GRR yeah. is a key metric, um, and NRR is is a really important one. Most companies didn't really track this as much. Because NRR is net revenue retention, which means with the existing customers you have, how much can you further expand in that company? So think about it like, like you know, you may have one product. Um, let's say it's a chat product. And from that, you're adding ad- additional products to buy them. And therefore, now the value of that one customer is, is a lot more. That's why the NRR numbers are 100% or greater. If it is lower than 100%, that means you have had no expansion opportunity, which means they're just yeah. buying what it is and renewing, and that's it. 
uh, and that's not a healthy metric. And I'll give you a really interesting stat. Um, I was looking at Jason Lumpkin. He wrote a few things on it. And he's like, well, if your NRR, um, just mathematically, if your NRR is 120%, you can literally keep going and, and keep, keep growing as an organization without adding a single new customer for next yeah. five years. Now, think about that for a second. That's not a conversation anybody is having. But if you're having difficulty converting customers, you should even more look at NRR because think about it again. If your NRR is 120%, which means you're selling more to the existing customers who already trust you, value you, you understand their business, and you should be able to be more successful with them. If you actually just focus on your existing customers and change that to from 100% to 120% or even better, for the next five years, you will still be growing without even adding a single new customer. I think that should just make everybody just explode if they don't know this concept. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so when I did my MBA, like I heard this over and over again in different classes, it's always cheaper to retain and to grow a customer than to go out and acquire a new one. So, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And, and just an example from here at, uh, at signals, you know, earlier this year, we, we saw, you know, Hey, things are starting to slow down and we decided, okay, we're going to really focus on our current accounts and how do we grow them? And is there more services product we can offer to, to expand their usage with us and retain them? And then last quarter we hit our number and sales did a, did a good job, but they missed their number big. But my CS team was able to grow accounts wow. by, by really focusing it. And we still hit, hit our goal. Wow. So, that is so good, right? Like it almost yeah. takes, Sure, of you as a leader and as an organization on trying to be this coin operated revenue machine to or like new sales machine to an actual revenue generating company. Yeah. You know, I think if you can grow your accounts and figure out how to do that, like you've got a healthy business because that means your customers will love you. If they're not spending more money with you, they're either indifferent or just kind of, or they don't even like you and they're just stuck in a contract and they're just like, yeah. yeah you know, we're in this thing for three more months, 18 more months, whatever it is. And then we're getting out. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's one big mega shift that I think everybody has to wrap their brain around. And thank you for letting me expand on that. The other big shift, Billy, that you and I talked about was this is, and this is again, very new in the last two decades. Most of the people who have been in marketing, um, we're all used to inbound and content and marketing automation. Um, yep. Some of us are probably also familiar with ABM in the last seven years and working on it. Uh, but that's it, like inbound, outbound. Like those were the two motions that most of us have been around. Now, guess what? There is a PLG movement that is upon us. There is also community-led growth. We, and this is a great example of what you're doing with uh, building community. There is ecosystem-led growth that... Again, you cannot put in the existing frameworks and funnels because those funnels were were made for acquisition and community and ecosystem are engagement uh, conversation. So it's really hard to put, put all those things in the existing funnel. So now all of a sudden, every marketer is either going to be asked now or in the next 12 months, hey, what is our go-to-market motion beyond inbound and outbound? And you better have an answer for that question and an yeah. and answer saying, here's why we shouldn't do PLG or here's why we absolutely should do PLG. And that is something people have to learn now on the job almost. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You got to be looking at more than one way to, to, to solve this problem. Um, so let's go through and like, let's you, you've done a lot of great content and like anyone, if you don't follow Sangram on LinkedIn, go follow him, connect. Um, he posts great content, but one of the things you shared earlier, I think it was just a month or so ago, was the different types of, of go-to-market motions. Yeah. Do you mind giving everybody like, hey, here's, you know, we've got PLG inbound, outbound, but let's just go down the list for anyone that's like, what else is out there? What options do I have? Well, there's a lot of it. I'm going to just pull it up as, as we're speaking so I can give you the yeah. exact definitions of it. So, and I, and this is my yesterday's post too. So you can, people, if, if they're following, you could just download it from yesterday. So I listed down six go-to-market motions. One, okay. inbound, most people get it, right? You know, it's yeah. content driving conversion. So no need to expand on that. ABM is almost the a a B uh, outbound is ABM. So ABM led, very focused on strategic accounts and targeted accounts. Product led. Now, this is really interesting because product led doesn't necessarily only means, oh, we build a product and people are going to buy. 
Like a lot of people think like that's what product-led means and it's a very limited view of product-led growth. I I advise everybody to really take a moment and think deeper on it. Product-led growth is actually much bigger than that. It means that you can add product-led growth even in your expansion motion by creating different models for existing customers to buy your other products at a different way, as opposed to sales process involved in it. Yeah. Uh, so there's PLG, I think is much bigger than what people are making it to be. So yeah. there's a lot of research that as go to market partners, we're, we're an analyst firm. So we're starting to write about it. And I'm discovering that most people have a very narrow mind uh, around what PLG is. And they think that, oh, you build a product and people will buy like it. No, that's, that's not how it works. Uh, you need to have a go-to-market motion to get your product-led growth to yeah. actually become a, a growth engine. Um, the other one is channel, which is really the the idea of distributed signals all over the place, where you're in- enabling resellers, agency, all of all of that things start becoming really interesting. A lot of companies, actually, Billy, you probably know as well, have built great businesses on the backs of great channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ecosystem is the new one that I think most people are not thinking about enough. They, you know, everybody's trying to be, oh, I'm the best. I'm the greatest at this product and here's how we sell it. But in reality, the best companies have great ecosystem. Um, you think about Bambara is a great example of it. It's a data provider uh, and a lot of AVM companies use that as a pipe for driving business and they make money every, on every single time somebody uses data. Um, you think about Salesforce is again another great example where they have a whole app exchange and a whole ecosystem yeah. is selling. Like I was at Dreamforce this year, majority of the people were part of the ecosystem um, using it. And then the last yeah. one is category led, uh, which I think a lot of us feel, a lot of CEOs feel the pressure to build a category. Having been there myself, I will say, don't do it. Don't do it. This is the last possible option. You know, don't take the blue pill. It, it is not something you should go after uh, unless unless you are ready to devote the next decade of your life to that singular point of view. Yeah, I, I agree with you on creating the category. It's it's not easy. I, I worked at Inside Sales when they before they were on their tear. And, you know, we were trying to create a category with the uh, with Dave as the CEO, and and it's a lot of work. But I'll tell you this: what fueled a lot of that growth that that they ultimately had there was the app exchange for yeah. for inside sales. Like on our marketing team, we were we were sending people like I'm running you know paid search campaigns that don't go back to our website, don't go to a landing page. They go to App Exchange to sign up and get the app and just install the free trial in Salesforce. And I don't know what the percentage was anymore, but it was a large percentage of, uh, of our new leads and and new business was just like app exchange and whether it was running ads or people just finding us because it was popular and we were always in the top 10, uh, huge way ecosystem. If you can get it, find a good way in, that's a great way to grow your business. Uh, and you know, I think, the challenge most marketers, everybody listening right now, they're like, okay, it's great. Okay, now I have to think about more than one go-to-market motion, inbound, outbound, if that wasn't difficult already uh, with yep. the conversion issue. Now adding PLG and community and category and product and channel and ecosystem. The reality is this. Based on our research as you know, as building, building companies, but now even more as an analyst, from what we're seeing, Billy, is every single company needs to have more than one go-to-market motion in play. Yeah. If they cool. don't, that's when they get in trouble. Yeah, you can't have all your eggs in one basket anymore. Um, so, there, I mean, you've listed off a few different motions. What do you think are the best ones to, to mix and match? Like, they, they yeah. play nice with each other? Because some of them are very different, you know, and it's like, okay, if I do this, you know, if I've got an inbound motion... I got to have a team that supports that. And then I, I might need a whole separate team for a channel motion or, a, yeah. or an ecosystem motion. Like, what do you think are the best ones to pair together? If you're already doing this, like it would probably make sense to try this one. Yeah. You know, I think a, a good pair uh, that we have seen so far, and I'll give you examples yeah. because we were talking to Snowflake and Atlassian and, and, you know, people who are doing it, you know, mega, like all of a sudden skyrocketed on PLG, one skyrocketed on ABM. And yeah. what we're seeing is, most companies, if you are a um, like a 
like, let's just take specific examples. Think about Calendly as an example, right? If you're in a very pure player, pure play PLG mode where your product is great and you have created a great market category out there, so that's when it works really good. A product-led growth works really well when your category is very well established and you're a leader in that category and you have created that movement where everybody's talking about you and you don't have to do piecemeal a million things. You go to sleep, yeah. you see 100 people sign up for it next morning because your category is real and you have built that category. So that works really well together. Um, another one you think about Snowflake, great example, where they were initially uh, did not have a PLG mode at all. What they had was a very much ABM play. As a matter of fact, they were very early customers of Terminus. So I remember meeting their executive team and the demand team, and they literally created landing pages for every single target account that they were going after every single one of them. And they literally yeah. had three interns, Billy, to build those things like, oh, what's the benefit of interns? They don't go to meetings. So hire interns because they <laughs> get work done. So they literally <laughs> hired interns to, to get and just create landing pages for every one of these, these companies. And, and then they would create videos and get those companies engaged. And 100% of those companies engaged, either say yay or nay, but they will engage because it was a page created for them. Um, yeah. And they were selling that and they were doing that because they were over $100,000 deals at that time. Now they're selling over half a million or a million in, in, in deals. Yeah. But at that time, that's what they started. So their motion was very targeted ABM motion led by an ecosystem that they were creating at the same time. So I think right. it's never the one and two, but I think there is that one, two punch that makes sense. But one without the other doesn't work. You can't have a product company and no category like you will yeah. fail. Uh, you can't have a great outbound thing with absolutely no ecosystem or channel. You will fail. It's like those, those, I think two things do come go to go hand in hand. Okay. All right. Let's let's shift gears a little bit and like let's talk about the metrics. So we'll, we we talked early about hey, what do they mean? But as a marketer, how can I be focused on growing that GRR and that NRR number? Like, I would mean, you know what do I need to do? Because like initially, I think most marketers are like, okay great that cs is problem you yeah know? that cs is problem when it's not like everybody should be on the revenue team yeah yeah you know one of the things that uh, that we have been teaching as part of our road shows billy is this uh you know it's it's almost a therapy moment for everybody to just take in and recognize this every time even the call that i was right before this with the cmo of this hundred million dollar company um is saying that well you know we, we got a sales problem and i'm i'm telling her that um, I don't think it's a sales problem. It's, this is a market condition right now. So to pin it on sales is to like really minimize where the problem is, is a market problem. And we need to now as a go-to-market team need to think about how we're going to solve that problem. So very quickly, I think we're, we're quick to dismiss and point fingers saying, oh, it's a marketing problem. Go create a new messaging. Oh, it's a sales problems. Go create, hire better sales reps. Or it's a CS problem because we are churning customers where the problem is that our products don't support enterprise. And that's why they're, so it's a product yeah. problem. So a lot of times people say this. So here's a therapy moment that we have done in every workshop to say it out loud. And so people may, may try that at home as they're listening to this thing and yeah. say it out loud and say it to the team meeting, whenever you go in the meeting, this specific set of sentences, it's like the creed uh, out there. It's simply as this, like, we don't have a marketing problem. We don't have a sales problem. We don't have a, say, a CS problem. What we have is a go-to-market problem. So let's now focus on what is the go-to-market problem we have. And that allows everybody on the team to take a moment instead of putting on their like save me jacket, they put yep. in like how do I help you jacket. And that's what you want. So if everybody can take one thing from this conversation is to just have a broader conversation in that meeting, bring your sales marketing CS product, not to say you sucked, but rather to say, we have a go-to-market problem. What can we do to solve that? Maybe we need to add a new feature. Maybe we need to change the way we do compensation. Maybe we need to change our messaging. What the ad, it could be any one of those solutions, yeah. but just because sales are not closing right now because of market condition, it's a bad time to point to sales. I, I like it. I like it. Cause it's not just, it's not their fault. Like okay. this is the market conditions. What everyone needs to get on, on the boat and say, okay, 
what can we do to help move these deals across the finish line? Or what can we do to help grow customers? And sometimes it's messaging. Sometimes it's a product problem. You're like, you talked about earlier, like, oh, they're churning out. We don't support enterprise. Okay. Like, what do we need to add if we're actually going to go down this road to support enterprise? Or they're churning out because they're too small. It's like, well, they, they don't, you know, we actually need like three or four people in a marketing team to, to make this product work, you know, yeah. otherwise it just doesn't make sense for them. So, you know, what's also interesting, Billy, I don't know if you noticed that, but product a lot of times is not even in the room <laughs> to, to, <Yeah>. work. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people in the go to market with, Oh, it's marketing sales and CS. But as you rightly pointed out, product might very well be the cause or the reason, or maybe a solution uh, yeah. to the problem that you're having right now. They may be able to come up with like, you know what? Okay, that's the problem. If you're not closing deal, but we can get more people on the trials, maybe we can turn turn off some features, come up with a new slim down light version of our product and get those people early on, give them three months of time to test it and then convert them in queue. Like the, that product could be the solution, but nobody's even talking to them. They're not even in the room a lot of times. Yeah, unfortunately they aren't. And like, I've even made the mistake of like, hey, we talk about this, but you know, and I, and I run product here at Signals, but my engineering team has a lot of great ideas is what, I, what I've what i found. And when we started bringing them in and we go through once a month and we look at everything that's closed out of pipeline, whether it was won or lost, like why did we win it? Why did we lose it? And often uh, our director of engineering, he'll be like, hey, it seems like this is a problem. I think it's actually a super easy fix within product. Like, I think we could roll this out this week, you know, give me a week and we can have that fixed. And and that's helped a lot. So if you're not including your your product and your engineering team, because even, you know, like, even just like the product guy who's like, hey, I, you know, like, well, this is what we need to do. Bring that engineering leader in because they often, they know how <laughs> how it's really made, how that sausage is made. And they can tell you, oh, easy things to do. Um, like I can get these done if I have my team even stay late tonight. Some yeah. of, sometimes they're that simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and bring them in, and they they'll help you. I think I think anyone, if you're not doing it, you'll be surprised. Yeah, you will be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit. We only we've got you know we can go over. We can do whatever we want here, um, but. Let's talk about some of the tactics that that you're seeing people are doing to help move deals down the funnel right now. Because one of the things that I've noticed from all of our sessions today is I'm hearing from leaders, the top of the funnel has is as good as it's ever been, maybe even better for some companies when it yeah. comes to sales ops. Getting them through all the way through and to closed one is harder than it's been in recent memory. Um so what do you think people can be doing to, to move them from, you know, this is a qualified or net new op to this is closed one business? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And it's something that everybody's thinking and struggling with. Uh, one of the things we are trying and testing, and it seems to be working right now, not 100%, but we're testing and doing is um, our sales leader, uh, he, he is literally creating a, a video of the walking through the proposal was a lot of times what we found is like, Oh, they're excited. Oh, they're ready to sign. And they got the budget and all that stuff. And then boom, there's nothing. And like, you know, we all have been yeah. in those moments. Like what happened? Did we not communicate? Like, where are we? So there are two things that he has done that has really been amazing. Number okay. one, he would always have a follow-up meeting set. He would never leave a call without a meeting set on the calendar. And number yeah. two uh, and with, with, with an agenda, here's where we will be and here's what we would do and here's what, what I'll do. So he was very good about making sure there is, there's just conversations set up. Um, and number two, in between, he's sending a video, like two minute saying, hey, we just talked through this proposal. Let me just walk you through what the proposal looked like. Because a lot of times now, more than ever, people have to go and sell internally. Even if they believe and they're yeah. champions for it, they have to go sell it to the CFO, sell it to the CEO, sell it to 10 other people. So he's like, hey, I get it. And you know, you're the champion for it. I'm going to help you sell. So he would do a two minute, very short video of walking through the proposal of what they get and what that includes and how it is a super value add and what we're adding and giving them in addition to what they have asked, asked. So they feel like they're getting a good deal because everybody likes a good deal. 
Um, so yep. you would do that two minute video. And what we see is people are now sharing that internally. So we'll see like five plays on that video. So we know that, okay, it's at least at a minimum, it's getting internally shared. So we know what's going on behind the scenes, at least, you know, in a, you know, from a metric perspective. And so both of those things are allowing the conversation to either get a necessary yes or necessary no, as opposed to a dark place, like where you have no idea what's going on. So yeah. I, I think I would recommend people to try both of those things. I, I like the I like the video proposal and like getting getting the meeting on calendar like that's just old school yeah. sale like yeah like you don't leave a call know. without next steps like yeah but you'd be surprised how often like we we leave a call and we're and you know I'll talk to my sales team I'm like hey great they're like oh great call blah 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 and I'm like good when's the next call yeah oh <laughs> yeah yeah or like yeah. yeah. No, I'm gonna send an email. Like, no, nobody responds no, no, no. Emails to get a time, and nobody has time. Like, it's just so yeah. little, but it's such an important, impactful thing. And you're right; it's an old school one on one, but super valuable. Super valuable, and and the video proposals. I used to do them when we were first starting. Whenever I'd send a proposal out, I would use uh, Loom and just like Loop, one minute. Here's what it is, walking you through everything, and I thought it was great. It, yeah. It let people just even if even if it was just to the person and I was already talking to the the right. signer. Yeah. They had that, they've got a million things on their plate. It's easy to go back and watch a one to two minute video. Right. Um oh wait. And then you mentioned one other tactic you guys have you guys have been helping people use, which is ROI studies. Like yeah. I think more than ever, you're gonna see the CFO getting involved in almost any deal over the next 12 to 18 months. And uh, they're gonna wanna know. What's the return on this? Yeah, absolutely. So with the analyst firm that we launched, GDM Partners, uh, we're doing like 50 or so ROI studies now for companies to, to really share what is out of the... I mean, that's the one question that's behind everybody's mind right now. Like, why, why should I buy this? Uh, it's not that you don't like people or you don't like... I mean, a lot, of, a lot of it is true. But if you don't know and if you can't very easily and quickly give an ROI story it's gone. And if it's not a third party yeah. validation, then you can say all day long, we're the best product, we're the industry leader. It, it's like noise. So yeah. for a lot of our customers, Sendoso, Salesloft, uh, Open Prize, all of these companies, we are creating ROI study um, and launching that. And it's literally one of the best things they're using from a sales outreach perspective. So are you guys going to customers, interviewing, like interviewing them, getting the data, putting it together? You know, because like, there's a lot of ways to do these ROI studies, yeah. Um, yeah. and we, and how do we, like let, let's help our our you know whoever is here and and watching like if you want to go do an ROI study down and dirty and, yeah. and get something for to arm your sales team with, what do you think they should be doing? Oh, great, great question. So what the way we do it is we literally have partnership with G2 that allows yeah. us to look at behind the scenes data reviews and look at the actual data of what companies, which companies are winning, losing. So we have a little bit extra analysis of it. So we look at that. We look at Wimbora data, looking at what does the intent look like. We have a ton of different data elements that allows us to have a very quantifiable third party validated uh, uh, analysis of saying, well, here's what your time to value is based on just hundreds of reviews already available, right? But with yeah. a, a stamp of a third party. But then if somebody wants to just do this by themselves, absolutely use G2. Uh, look at your, ask your customers quantifiable things that they can, that you can use and then have stories around it. But one of the most important things that you would, that I see missed are the use cases. What is the use case for which that ROI made sense? So yeah. we will layer on very clearly defined use cases like mid-market use case, enterprise use case, financial services use case. So when you're talking to a direct customer who is in that industry or in that size, it will speak directly to them. A lot of yeah. times ROI studies are very generic and like, I don't yeah. even know if it matters to me. So so you need to get a little bit more direct and focused on it. I like it. I like it. And then I think a lot of times, like we've all seen the ROI calculator that they'll send you in, you know, in a fancy spreadsheet or it's on the website. I don't, personally, I'm not a fan of, of sending those out because it just seems like you can manipulate it to be whatever you want, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I like the study where you're actually talking to customers and say, hey, for X use case, 
because you may hopefully your products got more than one use case. Right. You know? And that's what you want to let people know. It's like, okay, it's more expansive than I thought, or it's more deeper than I thought, or it's more yeah. uh, insightful than I thought. And, and I think that's what you want for that next conversation to happen. I like it. I like it. Okay, Sangram, anything, anything that I should have asked you if, if you're like, hey, if this Billy guy was smart, he would ask me this question before we break. Uh, no, man, I think you did great. As a matter of fact, as a gift, because this was such a fun conversation. If anybody wants to uh, follow me and, and send me a note on LinkedIn, I will send you a copy of uh, the, the Move book. Um, Sendoso bought 2,000 copies of the book. And so I'm just wanting to give that away. So <laughs> shout out to Sendoso for buying the book. And uh, anybody who's listening, if this is worth and you want to take go to market to the next, it would be a free gift from me and Sendoso and we'll ship it to you. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. I've read the book. It's great. So, so go ahead, get the book. It take him up on this offer guys. So, Oh, Hey, thank you, Sangram. And then stick around. I know we've got one Pete's going to wrap up our live session for demand gen. And uh, thanks for joining us for the demand gen summit. All right. Thanks, Billy. Thanks everyone.